Afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jason Haas. Welcome to the weekly, well, I guess bi-weekly now, Instagram Live broadcast from Tablas Creek. Um, I am super excited for my guest today. I have Meg Maker, who is one of my favorite writers about food and wine and terroir. Um, she is also a content strategist and a consultant um, and has really interesting insights into, into both food and wine and writing about food and wine. So I'll be inviting her shortly. But while we wait for people to join, I want to do as I usually do and give everyone a little virtual tour of what's going on here at the winery. So um, we're done picking. That's the big news. So if you go out into the vineyard, there is not much in the way of fruit. Um, still looks like it would. Normally at this time of year, we'd be still be harvesting, but we finished a couple of weeks early. Um, and that's just because it never cooled down in... Um, really from the middle of August until now. It's still, highs are still 15 degrees above, above normal averages. So it was just a, just a sprint to the tape. Um, anybody who's interested in what harvest was like, I wrote a harvest recap blog last week. So that's up on the blog right now. You can still find the occasional cluster out in the vineyard. These are mostly second crop clusters that flowered a little later, um, which uh, we, the crew left as they were picking because they weren't ripe and these will stay there. They'll get eaten by birds or they'll get eaten by our, our flock of sheep when they get, get out into the vineyard. Um, you, uh, da, 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 da. Um, what we're doing in the vineyard mostly now is we are um, getting it ready for winter. So that means spreading compost. Um, you know, we have a couple of tractors uh, moving, moving compost around and getting it out on the vines. It means getting the sheep that we have uh, back out there. Um, you can see a handful of them here. We've got them split into two different flocks right now. So they're going through eating the, the second crop clusters, turning that fruit into manure rather than letting it rot out there and starting the complicated process that gets the, the, the microorganisms that are in the soil woken back up for winter. Um, in the cellar, it's still pretty active. Um, you can see this is what the crush pad looks like. These are tanks and barrels that have been recently emptied and which we're moving out. Um, we have presses going. We're doing multiple press loads every day. Um, these are most of our reds, really everything except for Syrah is still, is still fermenting. Um, so we're pressing out. This is uh, Jake Holbrook, who's filling a barrel from a couple barrels from that press load. We've still got some active fermentations going. These are some macro bins in the middle of the middle of our, the winery. Um, Depending on how long we want things to macerate with the skins, they take a little longer or, or, or finish a little faster. Um, and one of the ways that we know we are getting towards the end is that our the leg of prosciutto in the lab is, is mostly gone. Um, finally, one more photo that I really love. Um, I happen to be walking by one of our big wooden upright tanks, which you can see in the back of this picture. Um, well, Gustavo was digging it out. So those of you who know Gustavo, he's been here for more than a decade. He works, uh, he runs our biodynamic program. He works in the cellar during harvest and you can find him in the tasting room uh, for chunks of the rest of the year. So um, you think it's uh, you think it's glamorous being inside one of those tanks. Um, it's a, it's a, it can be fun, but it's messy. Um, Okay, I see one question come through. Does Tablas Creek have an importer for Canada? Um, yeah, we work with the, the Bocastel network of agents. So um, that's Charlton Hobbs in Canada. So they have different agencies in each province. We're not in all the provinces, but we're in most of them. Um, and if you go onto the Tablas Creek website down in the footer, there's a, a link for international agents. You can hopefully connect there. Okay. Um, so one last kind of fallish picture. These are pumpkins and shallots from the staff garden sitting outside of our, our front door right now. So I'm going to turn the pictures off and I'm going to invite Meg to join. Um, she is. So um, and again, I'm, I'm super excited to have her. She's somebody who I've, I've admired and respected for as long as I've been in this. So hi, Meg. Hello, everyone. It's great <laughs> to be here. So how are excited you? Excited to see you. How, I'm doing how really well today. How are how are things in New Hampshire right now? Things in New Hampshire are turning sunny. We had some rain, which was really needed because we've been in a drought in New England, and uh, we're coming off of rain. But rain means that we've lost all of our beautiful foliage um, just in the last couple of days. So it's looking very lacy right now. <laughs> There's uh, my my sister who lives in Vermont, where, where we both grew up. Uh, she calls November stick season. 
where <laughs> it's like it hasn't snowed yet. Um, it's cold. It's pretty dark. The days are short um, and there's no leaves left. So uh, not our favorite season, I don't think. No, it can be brutal. And the garden is basically done. I have leeks. I have kale. I'll have kale into the winter, actually, and, and uh, until the deer come and eat it. It's one of those crops that in New England you can actually eat and get good vitamin C in the wintertime. Cool. Um, yeah. Okay, so I would love to start just by asking you to kind of talk about how, how you got into wine in the first place. Yeah, I kind of backed into wine. I, uh, my husband and I, when we first met about 18, 20 years ago, I, I knew nothing about wine and he was the wine expert, but I'm incapable of having a hobby. So <laughs> I, the more I, more I tasted wine with him and the more I learned about wine, the more I wanted to know about wine. And one of my favorite ways to learn about something is to write about it. Um, I was first a painter and a visual artist um, and art historian. Um, but I, at the time I was getting really interested in wine about 12 or 15 years ago, I was doing a creative writing program and I realized that wine is an ineffable um, aesthetic product, right? It's really hard to talk about wine. Um, you know, it's like dancing about architecture, as they say. It's just really hard to take one medium and apply it to another one because wine itself is an expressive medium. So I started writing about wine just on a lark and uh, put up a wine blog in 08 that was pretty early back then. And, um, you know, pretty soon it, you know, it became part of a community of people who were all doing the same thing. And, um, and I was off to the races. At a certain point, I looked, kind of looked at myself and I thought, how, how did I get here? I never intended to be a wine writer. And I don't know if you know Alice Firing. She's a great uh, wine writer and, and great novelist and creative writer. She said the same thing. She's like, I, I never intended to be a wine writer. Um, I think... The, the wine writer that I aspire to be is a is a writer first and a person who uses wine as a lens on culture. Um, really the wine is is a subject that gets you into other issues about place and people. Totally. I mean, it, it's one of very few consumer products that's kind of inextricably linked to a place. Yeah, absolutely. Cheese is another one. Um, I don't know if people can see my bookshelf, but there's, you know, for every wine book, there's practically a cheese book um, as well, because it is, there are what I think of as terroir driven foods um, that are pretty close to what they are when they come out of the earth. You know, wine is pretty close um, to what it is. Cheese, I mean, obviously there's a transformation that has to happen and that has to happen with a human. Right. involved and that's why i consider humans to be part of the terroir discourse yeah um, my dad always did too he was he was insistent that the terroir was like was basically the interaction between the person the place and the product exactly yes exactly and i've had you know very ill-advisedly i've had arguments with winemakers all over most of europe um, about this and about half agree with your father yeah. Uh, and about half say, you know, no, 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 c'est seulement le terroir, c'est seulement le, 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 you know, it just, it's just the earth. Yep. Um, even the seller, I had an argument, again, very ill-advised argument uh, <laughs> when I was pretty new at this in 2010 in Germany at Muller Catoir with a winemaker who was 16th generation and um, he didn't really think of it as, he didn't think of the seller as part of terroir and yet you uh -huh. walk into the cellar and there's these dripping molds and how can that not be influencing the wine? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we've always felt like one of the reasons why it's important that we use native yeasts is that the yeasts themselves, the collection of yeasts that we have are not the same as the one yeah. in Napa or Chateau Neuf du Pop or even at the winery across the street. It's one of the things that, that has the potential at least to distinguish us from any place else. Absolutely, that's absolutely right. and and. Um, you know, I think we often forget that um, terroir, it's not just plants and humans and minerals. There's also fungi. There's a lot of bacteria and fungi that are really critical to the expressiveness of that place. And those mycorrhizal interactions that are going on in the vine, I think we know very little about it. I've read something about it, but it's, it still remains a, a mystery to science and, and to the poets as well, I think. 
<laughs> I love that. I love that there are still so many things that, that, I mean, with all of the scientific progress, we still don't know. Yeah, no, I think we'll get there. I think we're understanding more about um, the, the community interaction under the soil. But it, at this point, it, it, you know, humans, do, we tend to look above ground and forget right. about below ground. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's kind of a nice segue into the, the journal that you founded, which you call Terroir Review. Yeah. So tell, tell people about that. Sure. So when I was new at this, I started a blog called Maker's Table. I thought it was a great kind of little funny pun on the winemaker's table and blending bench. Um, but uh, it, it, it ended up feeling a little too personal and I wanted to expand it so that I do have guest authors sometimes on the blog now. So a few years ago, I recast it as terroir review. And terroir is a word that a lot of people think of as very effete. Um, I get criticized, I, or I hear criticism, a lot of that term as being something that is elitist. Um, and I think of it as really the opposite of elitist. I think of it as really about trying to look at place and how place is expressed through cultural tradition, food tradition, um, and engagement with agriculture. I mean, agriculture itself is a, is a fairly new idea for, a, you know, for us animals, right? Yeah. Um, so the work that I do there, I do wine reviews and I'm actually pretty conflicted about wine reviews. I have lots of mixed feelings about tasting notes and wine reviews, but I also know that there, it's a service that I can perform is to taste and to try to articulate what, what is going on in the wine and what makes this wine unique in some way. But the other work that I do has much more to do with the people of wine. I do a lot of Q and A, which um, I find I like to hand the mic to people, um, but a Q&A, it might take me hours to, to create because of the interview and the questioning, the research that has to go into it, the questioning, the transcription, which is exhausting. Right. Um, but then the co condensation of the person's idea and trying to really make sure that their voice and their ideas are being, are being honored in the finished product. Um, because I'm, I'm really curious about how makers think about their work and why they think their work matters. So there are my own, you know, my own travels. I do travel often. Obviously, I'm not traveling now um, right. because of COVID. Um, but I try to, as much as possible, get the story from the person and try to be truthful about what and how the, those people are thinking about their wine, but also bring my perspective into it as well. Because I am, I'm part of the, I'm a co-creator of the wine, right? The wine isn't, isn't anything until it's experienced. It's a little bit Schrodinger's cat, you know? Like, is it, what is the wine until you taste it? Right. So, so I, I also bring myself into it. And so it's not like strict journalism. I could never be a newspaper journalist because I feel that it's important as a creative nonfiction writer and as a memoirist, which is the other work I do outside of wine writing. I feel it's important from my perspective, for me to own my perspective and for me to show how I know what I know to the reader. There was a there was a question that came through just a whatever a minute ago as you were talking, saying that uh, the the reader always finds your writing very poetic and wonders if you're inspired by poetry in 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 some way. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, I don't. I wouldn't say I was inspired by poetry, um, but I I think I I hope that I bring a a poetic mindset to the work. I'm very sensitive to um, uh, cliche and overused tropes in wine discourse. And, uh, you know, the simplest of which is comparing, you know, making wine to be a feminine or masculine kind of idea or, um, you know, cherries, berries, supple tannin, like the, the kind of the, the narrative is pretty well worked over and it can be very tiresome. And it also, it doesn't really always get to my personal experience of the wine. Right. Um, but I think outside of just describing the wine, um, I'm really reaching for understanding about what the producers are all about, what the place is about. And I think in order to do that, using language that is effective, like right away, like I actually counsel some wine writers as well. And I always counsel them to get get the turn on the reader's senses in, right away. You're talking about a sensorial product, S like snap them to attention, like make them taste something right away, make them see something, make them feel something. They can feel the vineyard wind on their skin. 
that's going to wake up their senses so that by the time you get to talking about the actual product, which could be, it can be kind of boring just to talk about the product, <laughs> they're like turned on, like they're thinking about, they're thinking about their senses. And I think it works. And maybe that's a poetic orientation. I don't know. Um, but it is, I do try to bring a creative mind to the, to the text. Fast. Yeah. And, and I think, I think the way that you use language is also, um, maybe that's, that's why it, um, why that, that commenter made the comment that they did, because I find that you, you're very precise with the words that you choose mm -hmm. in a really appealing way. Um, and I feel like that, that, that makes sentences feel like poetry, um, even yeah. if it's not, even if it's a different ethic that's sort of driving it. Yeah, thank you. I also don't shy away from, you know, complicated metaphor. And, and I, I like to assume limitless intelligence in a reader, but not necessarily limitless knowledge of the topic, right? So if you come to, if it's a, and it's a respectful way of approaching your reader. Totally. I, you know, and I'm not the kind of person who thinks like, I don't care what the reader thinks, I'm just gonna write what I feel. That, I think some poetry actually is a little bit like that. Um, or can be, it can have that effect. Of right. Forgetting about the reader. Um, but, but I do try to, you know, make analogy and make, uh, add commentary that's gonna be, that's gonna enrich the topic rather than just, be too simplistic. So um, when we first met, you were, it was because of your work with Bonnie Dune. Oh, yeah. Um, talking about writers who, who write, write prose like poetry. Um, how, how did it happen that you connected with Randall and what was that experience like? Yeah, that was a trip. So I worked for Randall formerly for about two years, 2010 to 2012. Um, we met on Twitter, honestly. Uh, uh, he just, we just noticed each other because I was writing about wine and he was obviously a winemaker and I tasted his wines and I knew about the Rhone Rangers and I really admire Rhone wines anyway. And the American project, the American Rhone project, like you're intimately familiar with. Um, and we just started, you know, Randall is a very discursive chatty guy and, you know, we just started chatting on Twitter and it turned out that he at the time was just about to release his book. And because of my marketing background, it may shock your readers to learn that I don't make my living writing about wine. Um, I, I do, do a marketing communications consultancy primarily for nonprofits and socially responsible businesses and education. That's my thing. Uh, but I started advising Randall on just, you know, how do you get a book out and how do you find media to reach with? And so we, you know, we started having phone calls and blah, blah. Long story short, he needed a marketing manager for direct to consumer uh, sales. So the online and tasting room and wine club. And right. um, I tried to help him find somebody. And then he said, I want you to do it. And I said, well, I live in New Hampshire and I'm not moving. <laughs> um, but we worked it out so that I would just go out to California for a week a month. Um, and I did that for two years. Um, nowadays, probably I could have done a lot more of it by Zoom. Uh, as we all are now. Um, but it was really, for me as a wine journalist, a completely invaluable experience um, working in a winery, understanding the back office concerns of a, you know, small, at that point, it was like a 25,000 case winery, you know, family owned with, with all of the complexities, like, you know, everybody just kind of straight out of central casting myself. <laughs> invaluable experience and the club you know the club was declining at that time and so uh, we had to do we had to do a lot of strategic work to try to you know figure out how to retain and uh, and upsell and it was a it was a intense business experience i bet um, i i've always admired randall's willingness to to, to dive immediately into the depths of, of anything, of any conversation, of any topic, and yeah. his, um, just his utter honesty with his own thoughts and his own failings and his own yeah. inspirations. It's, uh, anybody who's, who's watching this who does not follow him on Twitter, he's one of the best <laughs> Twitter follows in the <laughs> world. Um, but yeah. he's gotta, that, that's gotta make for both incredible marketing opportunities and some real challenges. Absolutely. I mean, very strong personality and a lot of transparency there. Really believes in transparency. And you know, I don't want to speak for him, but he seems to, you know, he's really interested in himself and his own 
machinations. And I, I don't want, I don't say that in an arrogant way at all. It's just, he's like trying to figure himself out all the time because he's trying yeah. to grow all the time. And so it was, you know, it was like running to keep up with him <laughs> constantly. <laughs> and, you know, he's got this marketer reputation for a reason. I mean, he, he built an incredibly successful brand um, in a time when it was very unlikely. These wines were incredibly unlikely. Um, and, and, you know, yet that creativity means that he's always building on new ideas yet you, you, you're I'm like I'm having to operationalize them over here at the same time but I'm like right. three months behind <laughs> so he got another new idea this was yeah. when he was just starting to plant his new vineyard he just right. acquired his new vineyard and was just starting to plant it we we're like grapes from seeds are you out of your mind you know it's just but you know it's 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 a, it's a, just a great journey he's just on this very unique journey um and yeah it you know what can I say? It was invaluable and incredibly fun to work with him. Uh, all of us in the Rhone movement owe a huge debt of gratitude to his uh, just relentless creativity and willingness to do stuff that the rest of us would think was crazy. Oh. Um, but yeah. like, you gotta, you gotta have geniuses in your movement, and uh, he's definitely, he's definitely ours. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So. I know you've done a lot of work kind of telling the stories, diving into and telling the stories of a lot of the, the people who are making wine and cider and cheese mm. in New England proper. Um, I think, I mean, I know when I was growing up in Vermont, there was nobody making wine there. I mean, you could find some cider. You could yeah. find a few cheese places. I grew up like 15 minutes from, from Grafton. So this, the, there was the Grafton Village Cheese Company, which is one of the, one of the early ones. But um, what's that? What's that kind of wine, wine, I don't know if it's a scene is the right word, but that wine community like right now? It's a scene. It re I think I would use the term scene. It's just in the last 10 years, it's exploded. Um, cheese in Vermont took off really in the late 90s. There were a lot of pioneers who were women, actually. Um, and actually, sheep's milk cheese became, uh, strangely, not cow's milk. Cows have been on the decline in Vermont in the last century. But, um, but so the cheese, the cheese establishment, the homestead, farmstead, artisanal cheese in, in Vermont really picked up a couple decades ago. And Vermont, if you think about New England, Vermont is sort of due north of Manhattan. So Vermont's cheese and artisanal products kind of made it straight down the highway to the um, farmer's markets in, you know, all over uh, Manhattan. And it got, it got actually an international, they got an international reputation quickly because they were in New York. And Vermont, like people around here like to say that, you know, New Hampshire is a state, but Vermont is a brand. Huh. Because it really, and the state of Vermont has done a lot to promote its agriculture. So cheese kind of took off first. And there was always a kind of a foodie scene in Vermont, a farm to table scene that started here much earlier than in other parts of the country, not obviously the West Coast uh, was way ahead, but um, but there were a few restaurateurs and chefs who, um, Hen of the Wood, for example, and then Deirdre Heakin and Caleb Barber in Woodstock, Vermont, opened a, a little trattoria called Pane Salute and started promoting this kind of farm to table ethos. And Deirdre built a really incredible Italian wine list with biodynamic and organic producers from crazy, like Alto Adige and stuff. No, you, no one bought these wines in Vermont at that point. But she was bringing them in, and, and eventually Deirdre decided she wanted to hire to make her own wine. And um, there were a few vineyards that had started. There was remarkably a biodynamic vineyard on Lake Champlain, which is the fertile part of Vermont on the west side. <laughs> um, the, part, the part where the fields grow something other than rock. Yeah, exactly. And it's not zone three. It's sort of zone four, or B, or five even. Um, I, know, I know a cider grower in uh, Champlain Valley who can grow lavender, which is remarkable to me. Huh. But in any case, so Deirdre was a big part. She was sort of a beachhead because she started making natural unsulfide wines um, using biodynamic fruit, incredibly small production, maybe about 10 years ago. I was one of the first people to write about her because I knew her. She was a buddy, you know, I, I mean, I know her a long time. Um, we're contemporaries, we're about the same age. And a lot of other people kind of looked at her and she also does this great mentoring program where she has young, young women mostly and sometimes men stage with them. And they've spun off their own projects as well. 
um, people who have worked with Deirdre have gone on to, you know, work at other small wineries in Vermont. In any case, the long and the short of it is that a lot of wineries now are their people are planting or they're grafting over like maybe they had some Riesling that wasn't doing very well because they thought they should plant Riesling in Vermont. What they're doing now is they're planting hybrid grapes that were developed in Minnesota mostly, um, and some older ones like Baco Noir and whatnot, um, that are doing very well in Vermont. And, and there's this kind of natural wine ethos and this very low intervention ethos of well, really interesting pet gnats. They're also making hybrid wines. So we grow, you know, we have incredible heirloom fruit here, for orchard fruit, um, apple orchards. And um, some people are making cider, but some people are also making hybrid cider grape wines. It's a very experimental, crazy kind of place. And the wines are delicious. They're like $20. I mean, the productions are tiny, so, um, but they're finding their way around. And, and I'm just really excited about them at this point. That's, that's so cool. I love the... I love the, that the kind of small farm ethos of Vermont, which is, it, I mean, it's part of its DNA, I think, um, or maybe part of its brand, depending on whether you feel yeah. like that's inherited or created. But um, that, that because that, it feels like that should translate well to wine. Um, and yet it hadn't happened when I was living there. And it's cool that it, it's cool that it has. Yeah, it's not industrial wine at all. I mean, there is industrial cider being made in Vermont. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, it's orchard fruit or it's supermarket fruit, it's pressed, maybe there's cold store, a lot of cold storage and it's being made out of cold storage. Citizen Cider and a few others are making kind of bulk, big bulk but, the, but even some of them have smaller production, um, you know, bottled, bottled condition ciders that are much more artisanal, let's put it that way. I mean, there's also interestingly, a lot of cider makers who are working with just foraged fruit in Vermont. This is true also in New York state as well. Um, cause we have just all crazy old wild apples and some of them are fantastic for cider. So it's just a really exciting product. And right now on my site, if people go to terroir review, they can see there's a short film that I made with a videographer about Vermont terroir cider makers. Um, and it's only like three minutes long, but it really, I think shows and they're thinking about what they're doing. Cool. Yeah, I remember discovering an old apple orchard on our property when I was a kid. Um, there had been another house up the hill uh, that burned down, I guess, like 75 years ago. But it had its own fields and its own orchard, which was which was overgrown. And I had to do a, a, a kind of a, a tree survey, like a vegetation survey for an environmental science class I was doing. And I did it of that section and found a bunch of old apple trees that I like, I didn't even, I didn't even know they were there. And so that's cool that they're, that people are actually searching those out and, and, yeah. and doing something with them. Yeah, they are. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. So I know one of the things that you're also, I mean, obviously you're not, you're not traveling. So you're doing lots of things um, virtually via Zoom and yeah. sorts of conversations. And what are your thoughts as to the durability or the value of these sorts of conversations? Uh, like once once this acute period of, of pandemic is over? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, I've done a bunch of Zoom tastings. I did one this morning. Uh, for example, the Grand Dame, Verfico Grand Dame release of 2012, the vintage release. And I did a tasting with uh, Gael Goosens, who's their winemaker, a uh, young, really fantastic, thoughtful young woman. And, um, and just you know, a handful of other journalists, mostly in the East Coast, I think. Um, and, you know, they're very, those tastings are very intimate. Um, you really feel like you have access to the person. Very often they'll do a little PowerPoint or something, not always. Um, this one is just a tasting and a, a talk through the, the aesthetic of the house and, and the, the vintage itself. Um, but it's, I think that they will be durable. I think, um, you know, you don't always have to schlep your carcass to France to, to taste one wine, right? I mean, I love schlepping my carcass to France. Don't get me wrong, I love France. <laughs> And I love Italy and I love Spain and I love Portugal and I, I really love traveling in Europe and, and meeting with producers. And I feel that getting my boots dusty is really the way that I can understand the terroir and, you know, seeing and tasting um, on site. But the, the tastings, the Zoom tastings have been really well run. They're really efficient. We send the wines ahead of time. I get 
plenty of information ahead of time. I can do research ahead, which doesn't always happen on a press trip. On a press trip, right. you get in the van at 7.30, you're, you know, you get off the van at 11.30 at night, you get up and do it again, and you don't always have time to process. Um, so these are just the pace is a little bit more humane. So I do think that they will last after, after COVID. Um, I, I know that one of the things that's proven valuable for us is that, I mean, we're not a big winery. We make about 30,000 cases of wine a year. We've got one guy who does national sales for us. And then I'm on the road, maybe in a normal year, 20% of the time. And that's it. That's, that's our ability to go out and, and, right. and touch people face to face. Um, and so like last year I did a, a series of celebrations for our 30th anniversary and I did one in New York and one in Chicago and one in San Francisco and one in LA um, and a couple in conjunction with wine festivals, one in Santa Fe, one in Big Sur. And we did a couple of things here at the winery yeah. and that was our capacity. Like that's how much we could handle. And yet like what percentage of the people who would have been interested in that are not an easy commutes distance from any of those places like a massive percentage so just the the fact that you can have that sort of a, an intimate conversation um without physically having to locate yourself near where your audience is is is, is super exciting from a producer's perspective yeah absolutely it's so efficient and it and and also like for example i'm a member of the circle of wine writers which is a mostly uk it's a uk originated uh, international uh, group of wine journalists uh, about 300 of us something like that and not very many americans but i'm trying to change that um because i think it's a great uh, society but in any case they started just because of covid they started a weekly webinar with producers such as yourself making presentations and there's 15 or 20 international wine journalists on this on these calls every week um and you know th th that's an incredible reach right yeah. um that that you know we we're not we don't get the wine i mean i think you could probably do the wines ahead of time and some of the tastings are like that we'll send wines ahead of time but these these tastings are strictly they're just educational um right. And, you know, it's a particular producer, it's a topic, it's often it's producers, iconic producers. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to get to go to some of these places anytime soon, but I can have, you know, an hour with the winemaker. It's yeah. really fantastic. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I can't believe that it's been a half an hour, but it is a half an hour has already yeah. flown by. Um, how, if people want to either learn more about your work or about Terroir Review, how do, how do they do that? Yeah, um, this has been great. Thank you so much. Um, so Terroir Review is just like it sounds, dot com, Terroir Review. Um, and uh, there are articles, there are review articles, and there are uh, tasting notes there. Um, and then people can follow me on Twitter at Meg Maker, also Terroir Review. Um, same thing on Instagram, Meg Maker, Terroir Review. It's all very straightforward. Um, but I really, I welcome your comments, your feedback, um, insights, suggestions. It's, I love hearing from people. I love hearing from readers. So, Awesome. Cool. Um, so thank you again, Meg. Um, it's really it's such a pleasure. It's always, always good to talk to you. And I appreciate you taking a little bit of time out of your afternoon to come and, come and talk with all of us. Well, it was a delight, Jason. Thank you. Always great to talk to you. <laughs> and I will talk to you later. Sounds good. Okay, okay um, Tablas Creek folks, um, just a reminder that uh, we're still tasting outdoors. We appear to be um, headed for outdoor tastings for the, probably the winter. We're already investing in heaters and a little bit of additional cover and all of that. Um, but it's been great to see so many of you out here. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to continuing these as well. So um, we're not going to be on in two weeks because two weeks is going to be the day after the election. Go vote. Um, and we felt like maybe that would be more important than a conversation about wine. So I'm pushing it a week later, but I'm going to have Elizabeth Whitlow, who is the executive director of the Regenerative Organic Alliance on as my guest. So um, that should be really fun. And um, Look forward to seeing you all then. So again, thanks so much for joining and uh, see you in a couple weeks.